Welcome to this session of the Ancestral Healing Summit. I'm Lisa Bonnies, your host, and my guest for this session is Dr. Mary McLaughlin. Our topic today is the Irish Keen, Lament of the Ancestors. Dr. Mary McLaughlin is a singer, teacher, and scholar who specializes in Irish traditional song, especially the Irish Keen for the Dead. She's currently writing a book on the Keen, exploring the context, ritual, power, and influence of this ancient Irish tradition. And I'm so appreciative, Mary, for you to join us today. Welcome. That's just a great honor. Thank you for inviting me. <laughs> oh, I can't wait to hear about this because I think this is something that, especially those of us in the States, we may have heard the word caning, but we may not know much about it. So let's start out with what drew you to this work? Well, that's a bit of a story, actually. Um, <laughs> I'm Irish. Everything's got a story. <laughs> um, it actually happened really uh, when my mother passed. It was a quite sudden and very traumatic event. And I was with her for the last week of her life. And we, I'd heard about the Keen, but again, it's very mysterious, even in Ireland where I was growing up. So I didn't really know what it was. And it was at the point where after seven days when, when she passed and I had virtually no sleep during that time and there'd been a lot of psychodrama around the death, which often happens, as we know, um, the neighbour took me in to give me some rest. And then I went over to the house and my mother was Catholic, so there was a, a Christian uh, ceremony happening in the house. And the first thing that struck me as I went in was that there was chanting and I recognized what it was. It was the Christian prayer, the rosary, uh, but it was being chanted. There was this, this sort of rise and swell of it. And there was just my family there at that time. And I joined in and it was an open coffin. We'd had a wake the night before. Um, and it was at the point where the undertaker put the lid on the coffin that I felt, and I can only describe it as a scream in my solar plexus. That's the only way I can describe it. It's just this very strong, tangible feeling. And it wasn't a scream of fear. It was a scream that I had never known before. It was a scream of grief. And I knew it was going to come out of my mouth and I knew there was nothing I could do to stop it. And I ran around the back of the house because it wasn't proved this is the 1990s, and it just wasn't something that was approved of in terms of correct uh, decorum and correct protocol. I couldn't stop. I just couldn't stop screaming. And so that, after things had calmed down, you know, and I'd gone back to London where I was living at that time, some time later, and I was thinking through this, and I thought, was that the king? Is that what I was doing? And that was my point of entry. Into the, into the work. And that was 25 years ago. And I started just researching and um, I'm a musician, I'm a singer, I've recorded a lot of albums. I moved to, to California two years after mum passed away. And I um, made an album called Celtic Requiem for Wyndham Hill, which is now on um, uh, Sony. And again, I didn't even realize till later that was my tribute to her. And I researched both Latin chant songs, which were requiems, and Irish death songs about death. And then in the middle of it, I put uh, an improvised keen into one of the Latin songs. And it was, it was quite a moment, I have to tell you now, Lisa, because I had two engineers in the studio, the engineer and the producer, and their jaws literally fell to the floor. <laughs> and when I came out of the booth, they went, right, well, <laughs> don't know if we can really, I don't know, we don't know if the great American public's ready for this. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it was kind of curtailed, um, but it gives a, a, a little feeling of it. And then I began to look at it academically. I ended up doing a master's um, in, uh, 11 years ago and the year my dad died actually and I wrote my dissertation on the keen and so then once I'd started I sort of couldn't stop just I can't help myself you know I went and did a PhD and, and that was about 
other world songs. So I started off thinking, and my proposal was that it was going to be about the fairy world, which is also very powerful influence, you know, on, on me and musically. Um, and it ended up coming round to the king. And I hadn't realized that connection because it's all the other side of the veil. So that's what was happening. You know, there was this, the king is the movement into the other side of the veil. The fear of fairy world exists in the other side of the veil. So that was that was what brought me to this point. Um, that's that is such a uh, a powerful story about sort of finding your path without realizing that you're looking for it. It feels almost like you were uh, awakening an ancestral knowing because if you weren't necessarily aware that you know you were feeling the keen welling up inside of you until you know you couldn't not know. So let's talk about uh, the ancestral connection. Uh, so what is the uh, connection between the Irish keen and ancestors? Well, um, I have a wee chart here, which we can look at, which gives a few words, which help us actually understand where this thing has come from. And um, if we could maybe look at the wee chart here, there is four words on the chart. And over my left, there's the word keen, K-E-E-N, which is an anglicization. And then as we move down to the bottom, we get Queena, which is the Irish word for the keen, C-A-O-I-N-E. Then we move up to the right side and we see this word Kina, C-I-N-E. Well, my research brought me some documents in the 1800s which say that actually Queena is not accurate. The original word was Kina, C-I-N-E. And then here's the one, the, the, the surprise, the one at the top, Kinnet. That's where Kina comes from. And Kinnet is an ancient Hebrew word meaning lamentation with clapping. So the reason that I like to show this chart is to, is to introduce the idea that the keen is universal. It's an archetypal thing. You know, Joseph Campbell, the great mythologist, he once wrote that archetypes appear in different cultures, in different costumes. And the archetype we're talking about here is the lamenter, the mourner. So it has it takes shape in different cultures in different ways. So um, it moved into the Irish tradition where it has been very strongly preserved with that original word, effectively. Um, although it still is, uh, you know, practiced in many traditions. And it goes way, way back into antiquity to the ancient Egyptians, to the ancient Greeks. Um, in Ireland, you know, we have uh, monuments. You know, as I always say to anybody going to Ireland, you can't walk very far without tripping over or falling down a monument. <laughs> They're fairly pervasive. <laughs> so these monuments, you know, are one of the clues that we have, one of the ways into how our ancestors were living. Um, and, you know, I'm not an archaeologist. I have great admiration for archaeologists, but they can uncover so much. And they've discovered that um, our ancestors were being buried with grave goods, very similarly to what was happening in, in Egypt, for example. And the grave goods were all about um, the belief that the, and this, these were now high nobility, maybe kings, chieftains, um, and there was a belief that they were going to continue on that trajectory when they went to the other world. So they made sure that they had what they needed. So if they had a sword, it would go with them, or artifacts would go with them. There would even be food in there, like to make sure they were nourished and that they would feast in the other world. So this is this is a kind of a beginning of a clue here into some of the beliefs. And what would happen is that um, the community would gather and would mourn the person who'd passed away. Now, th there may have been a cremation or it may have been a burial. Either way, the ashes or the bones would be put into the, the, the tomb. Um, there was also keening. And that was written about uh, in, the, when was it, the 800s in a glossary about the ancient Logrecht, which was where choruses of voices would actually rise up to um, mourn a chieftain. And these people were paid 
one-off, a one-off payment for the Logorot. So this is one clue in through archaeology. The other clue in is through mythology, because of course, being an oral culture, our mythology tells us a great deal about circumstances, the detail of people's lives around these stories. And there's a story about Bridget, who was a goddess and who was one of the two Ahadidanan, and they were a magical folk. And the story is that she ran onto the battlefield where her son had been slain. And she gave this soul-wrenching screech and wailed over the sun. And it said that was the first keen in Ireland. The fact that that's in our mythology says that the keen goes back an incredibly long way. And again, we're not the only country where that has happened. In, in Rome, there were a group of women called the Proficiae, and they were paid... Um, uh, as well, and there are special laws for them. So, you know, the, the, the idea of the keen came through. Then the Celts came. And the Celts didn't arrive here until about 750 BC. So that was thousands of years after these particular customs. But the Celts also had their death customs, and that uh, involved the bards. And so they brought the bardic traditions to Ireland and the bards were uh, hired, or not hired, well, indentured in a way to uh, chieftains or to, to nobility. Um, they were singers, they were poets, they were composers and they excelled in eulogy and in genealogy. So when their hirer or their patron passed, the bards would create a special quinon special keen for that those that person and it would have the eulogy it would have the genealogy so all of these traditions you know, sort of come together in Ireland then the Scandinavians came the Vikings and they came around about 900 and they also had similar traditions and that blended in so by the time we get to um, 1100 we get a report from um, Geraldus Cambrensis, who was Gerald of Wales. He was a sort of a, a, they wouldn't have called him a folklorist, but basically he was a folklorist. He was a cleric who went all around um, Europe looking at traditions and comparing them. And he talked about the Irish funeral and how the Irish had this gift for music and they used it to mourn their dead. And then he described a scene where bards would stand, some at the head, some at the foot of the body, which was laid out in a, on a bier or on, on some sort of wooden uh, support. Flowers were put on the body. And then the bard at the top would begin this mo moaning, sort of uh, chanting, quiet um, incantation, effectively. and. That was probably the name, the name of the person, because that's another piece of this. The spiritual aspect of the queen was very, very strong in ancient days. And a lot of it had to do with the name, because there's magic in the name. We know that. And um, muttering the name over and over and over again would be the beginning of the king. So the bards would do this, and there'd be another group of bards at the bottom of of the of the corpse basically and then the family and relatives would be around it and the bard would sing alteratum to each other very similarly to the way the monastic tradition came up in ireland with monks singing you know like this one would one group would sing the other group would answer one group would sing the other group would answer that goes way back into the early days of monasticism in ireland so that was happening in the 1100s um the, the bards sort of dwindled, as it were. So by the 1600s, they were not so strong. At that stage, women were noted for doing the keen. Now, I've just been describing the noble funerals. Obviously, there were ordinary people as well. And they would have been, to some extent, mimicking what was happening um, in their way. So... There is a really strong tradition of women all over the world leading this. And that doesn't really surprise me because 
certainly as we come up into the 17th and 1800, 1800, we see that a lot of the Keening women are also the midwives in a small community. So they're literally bringing in life, bringing out life. So I call them the soul midwives. I'm not the only person who's called them that, but I think that's a really great description of them. So those women, um, by the time it came to them, it was this sort of complete synthesis of all these things happening, plus a good dollop of Christianity, which had also got into the mix. So there were three parts. By the time we come to the 16, uh, 1700s, there are clearly three parts to the king. And they have all come from this history of how the king has developed. So the first part is the salutation. And the salutation is calling the person who has died by their name. Now, here's an essential piece. The actual keen is always sung over a corpse. That's the real keen, as it were. You know, it was a funeral rite. It was a very sacred rite. So the corpse would be there in the middle of the company, which would be family and community. Um, the women who were keening would usually have a lead keener called the Banquincho, who would be the, basically the keening woman. And there'd be at least three of them, the Marakwincha, the women, the keening women. And um, then there would be family members and relatives. So very similar to the bardic setup. But in this instance, the Banquincha would start with the salutation. Then all of them would go into the gull spelled G-O-L, which is the cry or is referred to as the wild Irish cry. And this would be very raw, very improvised and also very skilled because they can rise up three octaves in this. You couldn't actually keen if you weren't a great singer because you needed tremendous flexibility of voice. And you needed, and I'm talking about the paid keeners. I'm not talking about the relatives who would do it just the, as I did you know, as, as a sheer expression of grief. So the gall would be the piece that people mostly think of when they hear the keen or when they talk about keening. The other parts are sort of got a little bit more buried. Then there'd be the dirge. And the dirge is a verse, basically. And that would be like Latin plain chant. be quite droney um, and on one note with a few notes moving down, unlike the gall, which was very, very dynamic. Um, and the dirge would be very personalized to the person who was deceased. So there would be a genealogy in there. You know, he, here he lies, um, the son of great people, that type of a thing. And there would be uh, another verge, uh, which would be an eulogy. And that would be, you know, what wonderful things this person had achieved in their life, that type of thing. But there would also be a verse of berating. And that would usually come um, from uh, from the people who are left, like, you know, how dare you go and die? You know, who's going to bring in the harvest now? You know, a widow would be saying, you know, how am I going to support the kids? You know, what? so there was that piece as well. And there'd be these different, very, very individualized verses that would go on. And in between each verse would be the goal. And as the gull became more and more dramatic and, you know, there would be the clapping of the hands and there'd be rocking, there'd be movement with it. It became almost like a dance in many ways, you know. So um, those are the three pieces of the keen, but they would be within a greater ritual and that was the ritual of the wake. And the wake has been very badly represented because observers from other cultures would see it and they thought it was being extremely irreverent. They didn't get what was actually happening at the wake. The wake was going on for a minimum of 24 hours, could go on 72 hours if relatives had to come from abroad or had to travel. So it was about being awake and watching the corpse. Now, there was, in the Middle Ages, very real fears of the corpse being stolen. There were a lot of bodies being stolen and sold for medical science. So there was a real fear of that. So that was one thing, one element of it. But it was also about supernatural protection. 
And um, I mean, there are reports again going way back where you know, women used to cover themselves in blue wool going to a funeral. That was about supernatural protection. So the wake became this sort of long, long ceremony that went on and had certain elements to it. And it still exists. I mean, you know, um, it, it, where I live, it still happens. Um, and the, there are certain pieces to it. One of them is the funerary feast, just like there was around the ancient team, team, tombs, beg your pardon, around the ancient tombs. Um, people eat meals, you know, well, not quite meals, usually tea and sandwiches. You know, uh, when we wake my mother, all the neighbours come in with sandwiches and cakes. That's a classic. Community gathers, they bring food so that the bereaved family doesn't have to do it. And then it's a non-stop, you know, everybody coming in is offered tea and sandwiches and cake and things like that. And that's the modern one. Well, you know, they were doing different things a couple of hundred years ago. Part of it was to offer around clay pipes which were um, specifically for that funeral and would be burned, buried afterwards. Um, and both men and women would smoke these pipes. Then by the 1970s, it was cigarettes. Now, you know, in these sort of non-smoking days, that doesn't happen. But, you know, there's been all these different stages. Um, the corpse was very much involved. This was like their farewell. This was their great send-off. So um, they would be involved. Sometimes people might uh, prop them up, that kind of a thing. And things that look really sort of totally irrespectful to uh, observers were actually part of respecting this corpse and saying, actually, they haven't gone. They're still among us. They're not gone till they're in the ground. There was also a fear that, um, especially again in small communities, that uh, there might have been some unpaid debts um, and that the corpse would come and wreak vengeance on them unless they gave them a really good send-off. <laughs> so there were lots of these things happening in the wake. Now, still to this day, you know, the mirrors are taken out or covered. And that's in case the spirit leaving the body would see itself and try to get back in. So... Um, the, the windows would be open to speed the, the spirit on its way. The corpse would be laid in a certain direction so it would go the, the right way. You know? That type of thing, all those, all those were in there. And then the wake was the jewel in the ring. There were also Christian elements. Always the, now, the candles are not necessarily Christian. They go right, right back to the funeral pyres. And then when... Uh, you know, they began to go in, uh, indoor burials like tombs and things that have torches. And then that gradually morphed into candles. So they've come right up. But the, but there's also a Christian element to the candles. So, that you know, in Ireland, there's this amazing synthesis. They call it Celtic Christianity. And it's just this synthesis between paganism and Christianity, which, you know, um, has worked very well, actually. And so that all com comes up in the wake. So... There would be rosaries followed by keening, you know, which is like these two totally different traditions, but they'd be both happening. The, the um, corpse the next day would be taken maybe on a cart or carried to the church and there would be mass and then there'd be keening at the grave. So the whole thing became this massive ritual. Um there was a great report, I think it was 1930s, a report of a man talking about one of these wakes and said when the priests were finished, coming up to midnight, when the prayers were done, the keeners would start and they'd open up and the entire assembly would become elated. So all of this laughter, and then there was the famous wake games, I didn't mention those, right back and those early, early burials, the ancient burials, they used to have what were called the Kikikincha, which were the, the keening games. And that was noted down in the 700s by another poet. And they would be sometimes trials of strength. There'd be all sorts of things. Well, this went into the keen games, which, you know, uh, uh, observers found, what are they doing? Are they very bawdy? There would be maybe wrestling. There'd be card playing. There was a couple of functions here because 
if you're trying to keep a lot of people awake for a long period of time, you have to give them something to do. And so the bodiness would be about maybe the, the teen, the teenage population or, you know, the young population, a flirtatious games, sometimes going a bit further than that. Um, there'd be um, the trial to strength about, you know, young men's energy being uh, harnessed, this type of thing. So that was a big piece as well. Well, this to people who came from a much more um, restrained custom of funeral you know, seemed horrendous. So the Merry Wake, it was called, and it, it got really bad press. But actually, when you go into it in depth, every single piece made sense. And then you had, you see, the setup. So you had a, a character called the Barakhan, and he was a local man, and he would organize the games. He was like the MC. He was the one that kept it going you know, and um, he'd play tricks and he'd encourage people to play tricks and all sorts of things. And that sort of brought everybody up. You know, in my own experience of more modern wakes, there's laughter as well as tears because they're so close and one helps release the other. And then, you know, the tears would flow with the keening. And then, you know, you can only take so much and then you start to laugh or you start to giggle and then you're crying again, all of this stuff. So the Barakon would kind of set all this up. And then when the Keening women came in, I mean, they were like consummate artists. They were amazing singers, but they were also very dramatic. And they knew exactly how to, how to work the company into this sort of grief this expression of grief and that was the second function the first one was the spiritual function of the transference which really got watered down and especially in christian times because um the priests didn't like the idea of a pagan custom custom in their area which was actually bringing the soul to uh, the other world they didn't like the idea of a different custom doing that um and so there was a lot of uh, censure in the 1600s on. There were actual edicts written, uh, ecclesiastical edicts, banning keening, banning the wake, uh, threatening excommunication to anybody who was found doing this vile practice. At one stage, um, some of the priests would go out and horsewhip keeners on the way to... Yeah, I mean, there was a lot of stuff happening in the 1600s, 1700s around this, but trying to stop it, so it was very underground. But in the country areas, it continued. And um, uh, sometimes, you know, the procession going to the, uh, to the burial ground could be a, a mile long, which sounds amazing. But everybody in all the communities would come out and they'd all be behind the keeners. Now, I once spoke to um, a man many years ago in County Clare who was probably, I guess, in his late 60s at the time. And... He said, oh, I remember them. I remember them. And I said, really? He said, yeah, I was just a child. He said, we'd be out in the hill cutting the tree. He said, you'd hear them before you'd see them. And they'd come round the corner and there'd be the donkey put on the cart and there'd be the coffin on the cart and they, the keeners, would be sitting on top of the coffin with their hair totally loosened, wailing at the top of their voices and everybody following wailing and if there were more than one or two keeners they'd be walking beside and they'd be keeping up this keen the whole way to the burial ground now when this when this man told me this as i say he was in his late 60s a very genial farmer his face just changed to the face of a very awe-stricken six-year-old and that's what actually happened. So I, I really got more information from that than anything about the effect of this. Um, so, you know, that they would, they would be just on top of their art. They knew exactly what they were doing. And they were psychopomps in a shamanic sense because they were leading the soul. And that was that report that I said about how they'd open up and the whole company got elated. And that's all about the power of chant. And I've had lived experience of the power of chant. I haven't had lived experience of the keeners, but I do know they exist. And I've spoken to people who have had that experience, but um, I personally haven't, except for my own experience. And uh, chant 
I know all about that and I know all about the power of it and I have experienced that where a lot of people together chanting, no matter what it is they were chanting, um, can raise a whole energy. And is that how the, the keen actually uh, works as an agent of healing? Is it the a raising of an energy? I think it's a raising of an energy and that energy does a couple of things. One of them is it helps spur the, the spirit on to its next place, right? So that's what they call the transference to the next world. The other is it releases and gives permission to release grief. And in that, it gives a tremendous amount of comfort. And this was one of the roles of the Keening women. It wasn't just about the expression of grief. It was also about comfort to the bereavement. These are things that are now done by hospice workers and uh, death doulas. But our ancestors had the, the women in the village who did this. And they would comfort, they would help express, and they would also do the spiritual, I believe anyway, the spiritual wing of song, which would help the spirit along so that it was speeded up. Because one of the really interesting things about the keen, especially the gall, is it's very fast, which seems strange. The dirge is quite slow, mo you know, chanting, moaning, sort of that level. And then suddenly you get these really fast, you know, um, hemi demi semi quavers, as we call them over here, um, tiny notes, this sort of thing. And I was thinking about this recently. I thought, whoa, I wonder if that was about the urgency. Because there was this sense of we have to make sure the spirit is gets safely without anything nasty getting in there on its journey. Let's move it along here. And I'm not sure. That's just something that struck me this week. is Because I've puzzled and puzzled about it. Why was it fast? So those are the, those are the sort of elements that have been involved in all of this stuff. Um, and I think there's so many ways of looking at it. Now people just look at the gall and think it's a, it's a way of expressing um, extreme grief, which is absolutely right. It is. Um, but the keen as a whole, all of it, actually addresses those qualities that Elizabeth Kubler-Ross wrote about. Because the first one, you know, the five stages of death and dying, so many people are familiar with that. I'm sure you are, Lisa. Um, First stage is, you know, denial. When you have a corpse in front of you being saluted, being spoken to, there is no denial. It is, it is not living. You know, that, that, is, that is, you have to start accepting this is real. Then there's the anger. And that comes into one of these verses where the opportunity to express your anger, which is a part of grief, can come out. You know, how, how could you do this to us? And then, then there's, the, there's the sorrow, which is, of course, in the, in the gall. And then there's sometimes also the bargaining. Oh, if only, and that be another dirge, really. If only, if only, you know, I could be instead, you know, that type of a thing, if only. And that's always a bargaining thing. So, you know, obviously the way this evolved was just through need, and through human reaction, rather than somebody sitting down saying, we have to do these five things, you know. And so the acceptance doesn't really happen till the end. And here's another interesting thing. Because you would be waked at home, what would happen is the community would have, and I'm talking now about small rural communities, I'm not talking about the big cities, but I'm talking about the small communities where this still lives. They would have a sort of a communal area in, in, the, in the commune, maybe one person had a house with a cupboard where they'd keep the tools. The tools would be special blankets or special sheets and there'd be special candles and those candles would only be used uh, within a wake situation. Um, there'd be other, you know, different tools, maybe jugs and things like that. And also the wash for the washing of the body, there'd be specific basins and all of these would be dedicated so ritual tools effectively and the house would be transformed into a wake house so you know the normal things of the house would be put away to make space chairs would be brought in the 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 
if there was a coffin that would be put in the best room. And this is certainly how it's done in modern times. And then at the end, when they would take out the coffin, they would have chairs outside. They'd put four or five chairs outside to outside the house. They'd rest it there. And then they'd lift it and start the journey to the burial ground. Meanwhile, a group from that community would stay behind and they would kick over the chairs. Now that to me is that sort of that you do in healing where you split the energy, you break the energy. And I do think that was one of the reasons that that happened. Then they'd go in and they'd rearrange the house, bring it back to what it was. So when the family came back from the burying, they'd come back into their home as they knew it, before it was a wake house, after it was a wake house. There was a completion here. And then they would have to start accepting life without the loved one. And that's all very much in line with the, with the three, stages, three stages of ritual, which are, you know, separation, liminality and reincorporation but the separation happens in so many senses within this funeral there's the separation of the soul from the body there's the separation of the loved one from the community everybody is suffering separation whether it's a relative or a friend or a co-worker there is separation the liminality is a space in between and within liminality it's betwixt and between and the laws don't apply. Time stops. And that's another thing that used to happen. They used to literally stop the clocks at the point of death. Um, the, the man I was talking to who I talked about earlier about seeing the, 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 the funeral coming around the hill, first thing they do is down tools. Everybody downs tools. Work stops. It's time out of time. It's like theatrical time. You know, it's, it's a different time scale. And that, I think, is one of the big, big lessons for for us, you know, in the, in the, in the, and I think people are getting it now, is we need time to grieve. We have to give ourselves the time that's needed for respect and honouring and grieving. And I think um, that's an essential lesson that we can gain from our ancestors. They did this. Um, a year and a day was the uh, time of mourning for uh, a spouse or a very, very uh, close um, family member. This is what I mentioned to you earlier about when I did my PhD in the Other World Song. Of course, in the fairy world, the magic kicks in after a year and a day. And that person is then absorbed into the fairy world. And so I really came to the conclusion that in actual fact, a lot of the fairy abduction songs and stories are about death. And the slow acceptance of that death. And it does take that length of time. And I know in my own case, my father died some years later after my mother. And I was living in the States at the time. Um, and uh, I just couldn't, I just couldn't seem to get over the grief. And I did grieve for a year. And on the anniversary of his death, I held a memorial for him in California, in Palo Alto, of all places. And um, uh, I had this wonderful uh, sort of renegade priest <laughs> who helped me with it. Um, and my friend, my, none of my family were there, but friends who had never met my father came. And what I did was a eulogy and I talked about him and I had some recordings of him and I played some of his favourite music and I honoured his life. And in doing that, it was like this huge burden came off me. And then I took everybody to breakfast and paid for it, which is exactly what he would have done. And that would have been the funerary feast. So I had kind of a wake for him a year after he died because I hadn't had the opportunity to do that as he had been dying. So um, I think there's so much we can learn from what our ancestors did. There's so much sense in what they did and we've lost it. And it is now, I think, I'm stunned within the last year by how many people have contacted me asking me about classes in the keen. And I mean, I've been doing this stuff for years and suddenly there's this huge explosion 
of interest in it because people are beginning to realize there are ways and I want to come back to my first point it doesn't have to be the Irish way you know the Mexicans do the wonderful day of the dead you know it's very similar so you know those it doesn't have to be the Irish way most cultures have got a form of mourning if you want to dig back deep enough to find out what it was well, I want to make sure before uh, we're we're running low on time, uh, you were going to be kind enough to offer a demonstration. Is that correct? Oh, yeah. Well, this is another direct line to the ancestors, and especially for Americans whose um, family came over during the famine. There's a real wound there, an incredible wound from the famine. So this is a, a famine keen that I learned fairly recently from the writings of Brenda Madigan who is one of the experts in the Keen who passed away himself a year ago. Um, so it's in Irish, it's very short. And the words mean, O oh God in heaven, raise me up. Don't let me, don't leave me in need. Don't let my children starve. And then it goes into the gull of a home, which is one of the classic gulls, a home loosely meaning alas but very loose a hon mavarig a hon mavarig ai an of lahis tok suis hugget manum no fog me in aspa no ma fast each other Ego on Yari Oh that little Philip at the end is a classic way that they would end with an octave leap. And they would end our, or preview the end with an octave leap. What's the purpose for that? I think it's a signal. We're now finally ending. Because this one would go on for a long time. And so it was just a way of, and, was a, and you can hear that sort of chant thing in the dirge, slight dirge that I did. And then this rapidity of the gull. I'm just going to do a little bit more, uh, just to give a, a little listener experience of this. And this is one of the religious keens. I didn't talk about these, but basically in the Middle Ages, there was an outcry that uh, Christ had not been keened. It was so important in the Irish tradition. So in the Middle Ages, there were keens written a thousand years after his death for Christ's crucifixion. They're very powerful. And the one that I'm going to sing is a piece of, just a piece of it, is, a, is a, the Queen of the Dream or the Queen of the Three Marys, which describes some of the crucifixion scenes. And in between it, there's the chorus of a home. And that's all it is. It's, it's ornamented. But it's really good just to get the experience of what that feels like, to sort of close your eyes and just sing the Ahom. And it'll come through lots of times. Ah, father, ah, Oh, 
That was just so beautiful. Thank you so much. Wow. It was so croaky because I've been talking for half an hour. <laughs> <laughs> well, imagine how wonderful it would have sounded if you hadn't been. That was just gorgeous. Thank you so much. Oh, my god. Very powerful. And I've done that like in a church with the whole church just joining in in those choruses. And so it's just so powerful. Yeah. Well, now I wonder, we've only got a couple of minutes, but I want to squeeze this question in. Yeah. Uh, modern day, we don't do this. You were saying at, at your, your mother's funeral, you felt this welling up inside and you knew you should not do this. We are all sort of uh, pressed down. Don't express that. Mm -hmm. And it just seems like by pressing it down, we're actually sort of, not only are we doing disrespect to the loved one that we're mourning, we're also sort of harming ourselves. How can we, how can we work within the confines of our current societal rules and still somehow express? What, well, you know, what, it's, it's, it's interesting because um, I know I'm keep hearing about keening circles. I haven't attended one of these. I can imagine what it's like. Um, and these are, you know, different. And there's a lot in the States happening about this keening circles um, or grief rituals. And they're really doing it after the event. It's a bit like what I did with my dad. And it released me. I think it's so important. I think that, you know, if, 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 if a particular religion has that effect, that's fantastic. You know, and some people can get all that they need from that religion. That is fantastic. But not everybody can. So I think for me, you know, I'm I'm into all sorts of world religions. And I just, you know, don't hedge any bets. We don't really know. That's my idea. So, you know, I respect all of it. And so I think the Keening Circle sounds fascinating. I've spoken to a few people who have attended them. And they've found tremendous reliefs in that. Um, for me, I mean, I teach the Keening class and I teach some of the Keens and um, it's, it's been very profound for every student who's, who's come. And this is all online. I wouldn't be able to teach in America and Australia and <laughs> Germany and Scotland <laughs> all at the same time anywhere else, you know. Um, uh, and it's comparatively cheap for people, so it's possible. So I do these online things. Um, so I think it's, I would say, look for them. Look for them in your own community. Look for what works for you in your own community. But these elements need to be present. We need to be able to give voice. And one of the things I love about the religious keens is that they're used as songs so that uh, they're not individualized because they're about Christ. So they're not those intensely personal, you don't sing outside the context of the wake keen. They're, um, they've got a different quality to them, but they've still got the elements of the queen in them. So that's what I would say. Listen to some, try to learn some, you know, go to keening circles, uh, whatever, you would ever come to one of my keening classes, but don't overwhelm me because, <laughs> um, you know, I, I, put, I put limits on numbers, especially when I'm teaching the keens because they're hard. They're not easy, especially for non-Gaelic singers. So um, we take it easy. But yeah, so I'll be good on. I'm not going to be teaching another one until the spring, but I will be teaching one then. And um, uh, think about it. I, even small ritual in your own way, I think, is so effective. I mean, I know one of my students told me that uh, 
there was a certain forest being deforested close by ancient forest and she was broken hearted and she went out there and she happened to have a phone with her and she just burst into this scheme. A completely spontaneous one. So it doesn't have to be necessarily about the dead body or about a dead person. There were keens for the emigrants. You know, the, the people used to stand watching until the train went out of sight with the emigrants or the ship around the corner and then they'd all just burst into the spontaneous king or the gull, spontaneous gull cry, a wail, you know. So I think there are ways to do it. We just have to, um, find, and, and like I say, the most important tool we have, whether it's keening or prayer or shamanic journeying or sound healing, the most important tool we have is intent. And if we are really clear about our intent, then it'll work. And then everything else comes in on top of that. These are all just ways to embody that intent. So that, that's my thinking on it. Beautiful. Beautifully stated. Thank you. Now, I want to make sure that I mention your website. It's marymclaughlin.com. Simple enough. Um, and I want to thank you so much, Mary. I've, I've learned so much from you today, and this is so deep and so meaningful. So I'm sure that people who are listening to this have learned a lot as well. So thank you again for being with us today. Well, thank you for the opportunity. And um, I look forward to the book, never mind you. <laughs> it has to be written, yes. Well, it's sort of halfway there, but... <laughs> But yes, it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful, wonderful tradition. And so I, I feel very honored to be able to talk about it. Thank you so much. Yes, and thank you again. I want to remind everyone I've been talking with Dr. Mary McLaughlin. And I want to thank everyone for joining us. I hope you enjoyed this conversation in the Ancestral Healing Summit.